This is Matthew with Another World Terraria, where I teach and inspire you on the topics of rare plants and artistic nature displays. Welcome to the behind the scenes time lapse of the Lamparium 1. First, I'm going to set up the substrate and the cork bark log. The substrate's going to be mostly sterilized sphagnum moss. In a moment, you're going to see me add some leaf litter and then some Pinus radiata fine bark chips. I'm also going to be adding some beneficial microfauna in the form of isopods and springtails, which are going to help keep the ecosystem healthy by eating decaying matter and mold. These are dwarf white isopods, Trichorhinotomentosa, and then next I'm going to be adding some large white temperate springtails, Columbola species. After misting with distilled water, I'm going to seal the container and leave it for several weeks. This is going to allow the wood to mold over and the microfauna will begin breeding and cleaning things up. Next we'll need to seal the lamp cork to prevent any moisture from entering the electrical components. I'm masking the lampshade with a plastic bag to protect it from the chemicals. Now I'm going to use some expanding polyurethane foam to seal the gap. The next day the foam is fully cured and the excess can be sliced off flush to the cork bottom. Now I want to ensure that the foam and the hole are completely watertight, so I'm going to apply some silicone. My initial idea was to make a round mask so the silicone would be applied in a perfect circle over the foam. You'll see in a minute though that I later decided to add silicone over the entire bottom of the cork, so technically this circular mask wasn't really required. I'm including this part in the video though so you can learn how I did it. Now I'm applying the mask that I made over the cork bottom and then I'm going to apply some silicone. Now using a plastic plant label, I'm just gonna smooth that over and force the silicone down into the pores of the foam and into the crevices between the foam and the cork. The next day this is cured and I am removing the mask off of the cork and we now have our silicone seal over the foam and cork. Now I'm making a new mask for my improved plan to waterproof the entire cork bottom. Going around the cork with some tape creating that mask and you'll see that the height of the silicone on the bottom of the cork is just enough that it will reach the top of the lip of the bottle. And you'll see that you can't see the silicone at that point, but that seals it and prevents the moisture from escaping and also prevents moisture from entering inside of the cork. Here I'm adding the silicone on there and then I'm using a brush to apply that. After ensuring that the silicone is well adhered to the cork, I'm going to use a plastic plant label to very carefully smooth over the entire surface and create a nice finish. After the silicone is cured, we have a nice finish on the cork and it's waterproofed. I'm going to now use an X-Acto knife to trim along the mask so that when I remove the mask, it will come off easily. Now the entire bottom is waterproof up to the level that the cork inserts into the glass bottle. Next I'll create a reflector inside the lampshade to bounce as much light as possible downward to the jar. Here I'm using a material called Reflectix. I'll trace the inner shape of the lampshade onto the material with a pen and then I'm going to cut it out with scissors. Then I'll trim it carefully so it fits snugly inside the top of the lampshade. Then I need to cut a hole in the Reflectix for the screw which secures the lampshade in place. So I'll trace that and then cut it out with an X-Acto knife. Next, I wanted to put some white cardstock over the top so the Reflectix wouldn't be visible from the outside. So I traced the Reflectix onto cardstock and then cut out the same shape. Now adding a hole in the paper for the screw as well. Finally, I needed to trace and then cut out a hole so the decorative nut could be tightened down without warping the paper. So I traced that and then went ahead and cut that out with an X-Acto knife as well. Now the lampshade is all set up and ready to go. Several weeks have passed and the mold on the wood is gone and the microfauna have begun to colonize. I'm going to remove everything now and get ready to plant the terrarium. I'm storing the substrate in a plastic bag to keep it humid and contain the microfauna.
After wiping the jar out, I'm ready to begin planting the log. Here I've got some miniature ferns, Elaphoglossum peltatum. I usually play around with various plants and positioning, trying to find something that looks natural and balanced, as well as attractive. My goal with this build was to make it look like the log had fallen and these epiphytes and ferns and moss had grown up over the log over time. As I gradually add plants and sphagnum moss onto the log, I use brown polyester thread to tie them in place. I just throw the thread into a cup and then I pull on the thread and wrap it around the log as I go. The cup keeps the thread spool in place so it doesn't roll off the table as I pull on the thread. I just wind the thread in between the fronds or plants, leaves, and stems and gently pull it in place so that it holds them onto the log. Then I just continue to build up the design, adding more plants and sphagnum moss as needed. Occasionally I mist the plants with distilled water to keep the humidity up and prevent them from drying out. Now that I've got the primary fern species on the log, I'm going to start adding some moss, liverworts, and other plants to supplement the design. When planting things, I try and think not only about how it looks now, but also how it will look in the future, and that includes thinking about the way plants grow. So for example, that small fern that I just added towards the bottom is going to be growing in a creeping fashion upward, and so I placed it near the bottom so that it would continue to grow up the log. I like to use tweezers when I'm working with moss and liverworts as well as other tiny plants. They give you much more precision for placing small pieces of moss in crevices and at the base of plants. Now I'm adding a little bit more sphagnum going further up the log because I decided that I wanted to place some moss up there and the sphagnum helps keep the humidity and moisture up so that the moss doesn't dry out. Now using some more thread to continue wrapping the sphagnum and moss in place and holding it onto the log. And as you can see while working with this, I often use one finger to hold the plant's leaves or moss in place so that I can work that thread in between and hold it down. Now I'm going to add the substrate back into the container. In order to create a more interesting and natural design, I'm going to build the substrate up in a slope. This is going to give the layout more visual flow and will follow the diagonal line of the cork log. I'm going to leave an empty spot where the bottom of the log can sit. Now I'll just carefully insert the log into the jar and position it. Using long tweezers, I'll make some fine adjustments to the substrate to shape the foundation how I want before planting. Now I'm using the end of the tweezer handle to gently tamp down the sphagnum near the front of the glass where I'll be placing some live moss. I prefer to use tropical and subtropical species of moss and liverworts as opposed to temperate species. This is for a number of reasons that I'm not going to cover in this video, but I do have a comprehensive article about this topic on my website, which I'll link in the description. Now I'm going to add an unidentified miniature fern from Peru, which is probably in the genus Asplenium. It spreads via creeping rhizomes which pop up baby plants. The fronds don't grow any larger than what you see here. I prefer to use miniature species of plants in my terraria because their size is a more appropriate scale in relation to the landscape and container size. This helps things look more natural and prevents interruptions to the visual flow. As I add each main plant to the terrarium, I carefully place moss and liverworts around the base and log so they'll fill in and create a nice carpet. I'm gently tamping down the moss along the front so it gets in contact with the sphagnum and will establish better. Now I'm adding some more Elaphoglossum fern and a bunch of moss to the back of the terrarium so we get a nice carpet of plants going. You might notice that in most of my terrariums I tend not to plant too heavily and I also don't usually use a large number of different species. I find that planting sparingly allows the plants and moss to grow in and look much more natural and healthy compared to stuffing a lot of things in right away. Keeping the number of different species relatively low leads to what is, in my opinion, a more elegant and natural display. 
And now I'm adding a small species of peperomia in a few spots to add some interest, contrast, and color to the design. Now I'll mist the plants with distilled water so everything gets watered in and humid, and then I'm going to go ahead and wipe the glass clean with some paper towels on the inside and outside. Here I'm using long tweezers to grab a small piece of folded up paper towel for more precision and reach. When you do this, just be careful not to scratch the glass. Now I'm adding more springtails to the terrarium to ensure good population is present for cleaning up any mold or decaying matter. Now all that remains is to let the terrarium grow in over time. Using a digital timer, I give the plants a 13 hour photo period and I occasionally mist with distilled water to keep up the humidity. A few months later, I did add a couple other species of plants, including a Lepanthes caledictian orchid, as well as a Trialina pileoides in the back. 